Um, there we go. And there, there's the audio. Uh, we're having a couple of uh, technical difficulties, but welcome back uh, to another episode of Chat with the Archaeologist, presented by the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. Once again, I am your host, Chester Levash. Sorry about the delay getting the stream going. We had a couple of uh, small technical issues, and we've got those sorted out now. So, first off, we've got some announcements. And I'm just going to... I can see that I'm clipping here, so I'm trying to make some adjustments. Uh, first announcements, tours. We've been getting a lot of questions about tours, and this has been a recurring announcement for the last several months on this stream. We have resumed tours, just as promised. We resumed by the end of last month. When we started doing small private tours, mostly working through our callback list and working with school groups. We are now ready to start public tours. Public tours are going to be held on Wednesday and Saturday mornings, and those are the only days of the week that we will be able to provide them for now. This is a part of uh, we don't want to exceed our capacity. Like many organizations, our operations were severely impacted by the closures last year. And so we can only offer a couple of days a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays. Although there may be some flexibility for private tours, which are groups of four or more. You'll be able to make reservations on our website, mesaprietapetroglyphs.org. On the left-hand side, click Visit the Wells Preserve to learn more information about how to book. A few guidelines. We do follow New Mexico State health and safety restrictions, and those restrictions and guidelines for your safety and for our safety, and they're changing day by day as the situation continues to develop. Now, I know this is frustrating. We've all been getting quite a bit of whiplash from the last 17 months of we get a surge, things shut down, things start to open back up, and just when we start to get comfortable, we have to shut back down again. Believe me, we're just as frustrated as you are, so there are a few things you can do to make the tours go more smoothly and to uh, reassure us that we can hold the tours in a safe manner. That includes masks. Now, currently, the state does not require vaccinated people to wear masks outdoors, but it's highly recommended indoors. For those who are unvaccinated, the state recommends that you wear masks both outdoors and indoors in a social setting. This can change day by day, so just show up with a mask, be ready to wear it if the docent asks you, and if the state hasn't implemented masks uh, if they're not required, if the docent doesn't necessarily ask you, you're free. Uh, so just be prepared with that. It makes things so much easier on us, and it makes things safer for you. Uh, another announcement, of course, as I've said before, the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project now accepts crypto. That's right. You can donate with Bitcoin, Ethereum, even Dogecoin. For more information, again, head to our website and click the button to see how you can donate via crypto. Finally, once again, thank you to all of our supporters. We've received a number of grants throughout the last couple of years that have been able to keep the project running, and we really appreciate the engagement from state, federal, and especially local funds. So thank you all for uh, continuing to donate, and a special thank you to the National, National Endowment for the Humanities and the New Mexico Humanities Council for sponsoring these streams. That's it for announcements. We're going to do our normal transition, and then we're going to bring our guest this month, Emma Britton, onto the air. Stay tuned. So I'm here with Dr. Emma Britton, fellow banana slug from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, thank you for joining us today, Emma. 
Thank you for having me. So, uh, Emma, uh, I understand you've been uh, in the process of a move. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I just moved from Dayton, Ohio to Southern Maine. So uh, normally when I do these types of things, I try to pick out a nice place in my house where there's like beautiful art or anything like that. But uh, we've been in this house for about a month as of yesterday. So there are in fact two twin mattresses behind me, right? This is a guest bedroom that I am squatting in, if you will. Um, the house needs a lot of work. I've been learning a lot about wallpaper how to remove wallpaper. <laughs> so each of the rooms had between three and five layers of wallpaper. Uh, so I've been busy and we have almost all of the wallpaper off. So we're down to drywall. And I've been learning a lot about home improvement stuff. So we're making progress, but uh, we are still in boxes and it is going to be a little slower than it normally is. Most of the time we move into a place, it's like an apartment or something, and I can usually get our home arranged in about a week. Um, this place, we're kind of more pitching for Easter <laughs> in, all, in all reality. So um, it is exciting. This is the first home we've actually bought. Um, and uh, I'm really proud. And I'm really proud of what we're doing here. And um, I love learning this type of stuff. I'm, I'd like to think I'm good at it, <laughs> but um, it, and it definitely tickles my archaeology side. I haven't been out in the field for time now, and it definitely tickles that itch, right, where it's not digging square holes, but uh, it, there's definitely some excavation going on, for sure. Quite a bit of stratigraphy to the wallpaper. Uh, I'm going to use, so I, I took a picture, and there's this line of wallpaper where it's just like five layers of wallpaper are just like peeling off and I'm totally going to use it in my intro to archaeology classes from now on. I'm like this is stratigraphy. Um, so and at least one layer of wallpaper has been painted. So if anyone ever tries to convince you that it's okay to just paint wallpaper, don't listen to them. That's the devil. <laughs> They're just wrong. <laughs> Do not paint wallpaper. Um, but uh, slowly but surely, we'll get there. And um, this place really will look like a million bucks when we're going to finish with it. So it's just a little bit of a path. And uh, it is a path worth being on. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, speaking of uh, stratigraphy, excavations, and people having some misguided notions, uh, I understand that your topic today is going to be on research biases and some of our blind spots that we have as researchers. Do you want to introduce that a bit? Um, yeah, I think blind spots is a really good word for it. Um, so the way I kind of um, talk about my dissertation when I'm talking to other people, you know, and when I'm describing what I do and all of that stuff, um, I laugh and I said, I did everything right. I used all of the major techniques, the proper methods. I got the proper amount of money. I did the proper sampling. I did everything what you were supposed to do, right? All of the classic papers, everything like that. And I came out with no answer. And, um, and instead, I got to a problem. And that's just a really fascinating place to be. But unfortunately, within the discipline, it's not a very good place to be, right? So um, I'll whine about it a little bit. Casas Grandes is an incredibly um, understudied region. And for that reason, there's not a lot known about it. We don't talk about it a lot. It ends up being a sentence in most Southwest uh, textbooks. And um, then we've taken you know, projects, ideas, methods that have worked in other areas very, very well. And it's been a complete cursed flat in the Casas Grandes area. And because it's been a cursed flat, I don't really have, I don't know where I'm going next. 
and unfortunately universities don't think that's very interesting. <laughs> um, they want um, projects that produce data that kind of are positively reinforced. And it's like, well, I did everything right. I'm going to explain how that happened and what we can actually do, right? How are we supposed to move forward with that? And how are we supposed to move forward as a discipline? And for those of our audience who aren't familiar with uh, Casas Grandes, where it's located actually probably is uh, a, a part of why things that work elsewhere don't work there. So would you mind telling us about the region a little bit and uh, then Huge moving thing. into your talk? Absolutely. Um, do you want to just go ahead and I can um, start sharing my screen? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going down. All right, we all good? Yeah. Excellent. All right, um, so I titled this The Nature of Things, and um, I'll probably circle around back um, to this phrase as I get to the end of, uh, of the talk. Um, but this is um, Casas Grandes area, and it is uh, oftentimes referred to as the International Four Corners. Um, as opposed to the four corners at, as in Arizona, uh, New Mexico, Colorado, that type of thing. Um, instead, we're talking about um, the international four corners between um, Mexico and the United States. Uh, the fact that the Casas Grandes area goes up and around here into the boot hill of New Mexico, just that corner of Arizona, just that edge of the um, Mexican state of Sonora, good chunk of Chihuahua um, kind of causes a problem already. Um, Southwesterners largely don't speak Spanish and uh, Southwesterners are very, very accustomed to working in the United States that has its own sort of set of laws, right? So Southwesterners are very aware of the laws during New Mexico and the United States, they don't speak Spanish and then jumping the border causes a whole bunch of problems. One of the big differences, and this is something that people have a really, really hard time wrapping their heads around as um, uh, United States citizens, is that um, Mexico practices what's called cultural patrimony, where they don't care if there is a golden pyramid on your land, right? Um, it doesn't matter that you own the land that that golden pyramid is on, because it is part of this natural national patrimony, right, which is the history of the nation, you don't own it. It belongs to the government as such. And it belongs to the government because it is the government's responsibility to take care of it on behalf of the people. You know, it, the national history belongs to the people. It is the government's responsibility to care for it for the people. Um, so yeah, sure, we do have archaeologists that work for the federal government and that type of thing, but here in the U.S., you can legally own archaeological sites, materials, that type of thing. In, the, in Mexico, you cannot, right? Um, most uh, Southwesterners are really not trained in that kind of world, and so you really do have to go in as a foreigner, right, um, and learn how to work in that system. Right, um, and it is a lot, right? And uh, when you're working in a culture area that is international, that means there are times that I do work in New Mexico where I have to adapt to what New Mexico and the museums require of me. Then I jump the border and then I have to go play that game and do what they want and all of that type of thing. And so you have to be really, really flexible and it is a lot to ask of archeologists to constantly tick on and off, right? Um, so Casas Grandes, though, is a very important area um, to understand, especially for um, this kind of greater South. It is important to incorporate it into our textbooks um, to make it which is also referred to as Casas Grandes, right? 
Um, Pakime is the largest um, uh, site. Very tall, right? We still have the floor. Uh okay. Okay, so um, should I go back and talk about the site? Sorry, folks, about the uh, glitches we had there. I have no idea why it just did that. So I'm going to do a little description of Pakime again. It is the biggest blip on the map. Um, I don't really care how you're going to define a city. It is a city. It has uh, public waterworks. It has public cisterns. It has gutters. It has monumental architecture. If you're really into Mesoamerica, you will have already keyed on to those two eye-shaped ball courts, right? Uh, very, very prevalent, very um, um, obvious, right? Um, it would have been three stories tall. We still have the stories, the floors, uh, very complicated. Um, they had macaws, right? Some of which were imported, some of which are native. Um, and then they also had um, turkeys. They bred turkeys or turkey pens. So that's a really big thing as well. Um, oftentimes, they talk about turquoise at um, Pakame. I've seen the turquoise. It's pretty, um, it's not great turquoise. <laughs> no one is going to be um, shelling out any money for that. But there's a lot of marine shell, which has gotten a lot of interest. There's literally an entire room that was full of marine shell. Um, and then um, there was also um, uh, copper. And the copper is coming out of West Mexico. As well. So this is a place that uh, really had a lot of kind of goodies, right? Um, and um, was truly the biggest blip at the time. And so um, Pakime is typically thought of to be around 1300. Uh, we don't have good dates on it. Um, this is one of the things that we need to remedy. Uh, Casas Grandes, though, as an entire area, as a culture area, is about 1150, and you can fuss at me about that. We don't have fantastic dates, so these things shift one way and the other. But 1150 is something I'm com comfortable with to about 1450. And um, that's just before contact. So we have um, uh, accounts from um, conquistadors and that type of thing, Spanish um, um, adventurers, if you will. Um, and they are describing Casas Grandes. And at the time, it was already quote unquote abandoned. Um, it was not a, 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 an existing city. Now, that doesn't mean that the area was unpopulated. There were people there. Uh, the city itself was just uh, not at, occupied at that time. Um, so that's kind of Casas Grandes. It has had episodic research through time. Uh, Charles de Peso did a lot of work in the 70s. Um, it was the, one of the first international projects where he was working with someone um, from INA, which is the Instituto Nacional de Antropología y Historia. And um, 
that was an incredibly important excavation, right? Lasted years, right? Produced huge amounts of data. Um, then there's been various other little projects through time, including, and I say little, they're not little, um, Mike Whalen's work, Jane Kelly's work, but it is one of those things where all of a sudden there'll be stuff and then nothing and then stuff and then nothing. And so there really isn't continuity within Casas Grandes research. There is not a thread that I can take you on. Um, right now, uh, people who are kind of plus or minus my age and point of their career, um, very few of us have actual jobs uh, at universities that do research. Um, there are some graduate students coming up still, and I'm hugely supportive of them, of course. Um, but uh, we are in another kind of point where it is going into a lull, right? And um, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, why I think that lull is, is um, going to happen here. So I, I'm talking about Casas Grandes Pacime, right? As it's being the biggest slip on the map. And why do we care so much about Casas Grandes? And this is a slide that I've stolen out of one of my um, talks that I give um, intro students about the state, right? So when we get to political organization and it's why is archeology, span why is anthropology relevant? Why do we care how past people lived? How do we, why do we care what old cities look like? They don't exist anymore. Why do we care about them? So um, for those of you who are very, very um, hip to, to the uh, jive here, you will recognize Tenochtitlan, right? This is the Aztec capital. Um, and of course, all the Southwesterners will recognize Chaco, right? And then of course, in North America, there's Cahokia, right? Um, these are all fairly indisputable states, state level organizations, state level political organizations. Um, Chaco is a little mm, about whether or not it's a state. It is socially complex. Let's just go with that nice little uh, phrase there. These are all socially complex Places, right? Um, they um, they are state level, you know, socially complex places, people, um, and we care about them because we care about ourselves. <laughs> uh, we live in a state level society, and up until fairly recently, um, state level societies are inherently unstable. And one of the things that we as archaeologists are always trying to figure out is why. If they're so unstable, why do they come to be? How do they come to be? And then why do they fall apart, especially when they do, right? Um, what is the thing that holds them together? And it is because of these dates, right? Um, most state level societies only last a couple of centuries um, on the outside. And um, if we all get in the way back machine and look at when our own country and other state level societies were founded, we're kind of at that end point, right? And we want to know how we can not, because when state level societies collapse, everyone suffers. It's not just the rich, it's not just the poor, it's everybody. So how do we, you know, how did we get here? How do we stay here, right? How do we avoid societal collapse? How do we stay away from these um, other things that have happened to states and why they happen to states and how, how can we continue um, our lives the way that um, we are now, right? So um, Casas Grandes is definitely on that list of other potential state level societies within North America. Um, it's not in any of the textbooks at this time. Like I said, in the American Southwest, it's usually like a sentence. Um, and it's definitely in that same kind of ambiguous area as Chaco, where it's like, it is the other flirtation, if you will, uh, with a state level society in the American Southwest, in the greater Southwest, right? It's why did people who were living in middle range societies, right? And these little pueblos and that type of thing, suddenly build a city. How did that happen, right? Why did it happen? 
And then why did it go away, right? So if we want to understand all of these things, you know, it's got to be in the works, right? So that's the reason why we care about these places, right? We care about ourselves. We care um, about history, right? Um, and the more we know, the better prepared we are to move forward. So one of archaeologists, and you guys will know, will know this, right? Uh, one of archaeologists' greatest lines of evidence are archaeological ceramics. So um, specifically, I deal with polychrome, which means the pretty painted pottery. Um, there, you can learn a lot from um, utilitarian wares, of course, too. I'm not hating. Uh, but for my dissertation and for my research at this time, I have specialized in polychrome. Casas Grandes um, is fairly unique in the American Southwest in that um, there are eight polychrome types that coexist at the same time. Um, for those of you who uh, spend a lot of time in the Southwest, you'll know that polychrome types tend to come in and out of style, right? We, they um, frequency creates these big, beautiful battleship curves, and we can use those battleship curves to um, date sites and put them in relative order to each other. So typically speaking, there's only um, one polychrome type or even a, a very small series of polychrome types that are quote unquote fashionable at any one time. Uh, that is not the case in the Costas Grandes area. There are eight polychrome types. Uh, they coexist uh, fairly equally. That doesn't mean that there's uh, certain polychrome types that are more or less common. Um, at any one time, uh, but it certainly doesn't shift in any kind of predictable or useful for us archaeologists way. Um, the type that you will be at all familiar with is uh, Ramos polychrome. It's the pretty stuff. Um, it's the stuff that is collected. It is the stuff that you will see at antique markets in New Mexico. Um, I used to go around and take pictures, right, of whole pots. Um, uh, and not just Ramos polychrome, but it is the type that is most often collected. And it is uh, defined by this white firing paste, and then red elements are outlined in black paint, right? Very fine line, right? Uh, very well executed. We think of it as being pretty, right? The next, um, and probably actually the most common type though, uh, in the Casas Grandes area is Babikara polychrome which is the one down in the corner here. And it is a uh, rougher paste, right? So these are two uh, screenshots of paste. So the one up top is that light firing paste is very fine. We'll keep talking about that. And the one below is d dark brown. And granted, there is some soot, dep uh, soot deposition there. There's some carbon deposition. Um, but it is brown, and it tends to be a little bit coarser, right? It's a coarser uh, textured uh, pottery. It has red elements, but they are not outlined in black. And very typically, they're um, uh, sloppy paint, right? So um, not very well executed, if you will. Uh, there is a variant which is prominent in my dissertation. is white paste babikara, and it uh, is a combination of the two. So a light firing place with sloppy design, right? Um, in addition to these um, kind of two major types and then a variant, uh, there's Huerigos, Herretas, Corralitos, Diauma, Dublan, and Escondida polychromes, right? Um, these are important. Um, I have not done considerable research on them. I have looked at them, um, but they have not been um, subject to my um, uh, dissertation research or any other research agendas, really. And it mostly has to do with quantity, right? Um, I have seen like three Coralitos in a shirt collection and collection of shirts. Most of the Coralitos I've actually seen is in whole pots, right? So for example, um, at Mayak or, or someplace like that. Um, Via Almada is fairly common. Um, Dublon is fairly uncommon. Caretas is fairly common. Um, Caretas is important and kind of one of the next uh, types of pottery I'm really interested in because it has a lead glaze paint. 
Um, it is not related to other glaze paints in the American Southwest from what I can tell, but we also don't know what they are. So those are of um, interest as well. So um, we talk about these um, pottery types because they're easy to get. There's a lot of them. Um, and they are found throughout the Casas Grandes area. So this is something that you can find at any site in these areas. And by far and away, you can find Ramos de Vigre and White Paste de Vigre at any site that you go to. Right? So um, that's a reason to really focus on these in terms of looking at research. Um, so what I actually do, this is my speciality. Um, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, I thought there was another slide in there. Uh, I look at, there should be another slide in there. Maybe it's the next one. Um, what ceramics are made of, right? And what my dissertation was supposed to be and what it was, right? It wasn't just supposed to be, it was, um, was how are these polychrome ceramics made, produced? And how are they then distributed across the Costas Grandes area? So I use two collections, right? So I'm a collections-based researcher. That doesn't mean I don't do field work. I love digging square holes, right? It's just not the focus of my dissertation research, right? And it's not something that um, I've never been a PI, for example, um, on, a, on that type of project. But I am a museum collections-based researcher. So there's the sales collection. This is from 1936, right? Um, it's a unique collection in that um, it uh, sales, EB sales, uh, legally got permission from the Mexican government. There's like a telegram and everything uh, to go across the border and do surface collections from a bunch of different sites, right? Um, he got in his little, you know, T.T. Ford and off he drove around in Chihuahua in the 1930s. And he came back with this huge collection of shirts. Um, and I ended up looking at, um, so I ended up looking at well over 2000 um, shirts from this collection, but I ended up narrowing my actual sample to 185 shirts from 27 sites throughout the Casas Grandes area. And you'll see this, I've picked sites north of Pakime, right? I picked sites that are central to Pakime, and then I picked sites that are south of Pakime, right? Um, sales did make a map. Uh, it is not a very good map, and it certainly is not using um, modern day mapping techniques, right? No GPS. No, but nothing like that. And he wasn't a particularly um, excellent mapper, if you will. Um, he does other things very well, right? I'm not, this is not an aspersion on his character or anything. It's just the nature of that work at that time. It was a lot and um, he did what he could. Uh, so of what I subsampled, the 185 shirts, 48% was the Bigra polychrome, 42% Ramos polychrome, and about 9% was white paste the Bigra. Um, site 204 is a site that is near Hakime. Um, it is another big blip on the map. There's an I-shaped ball court. It was excavated by um, Mike Whalen and his crew um, before me. And uh, site 204 is unique in that it has midden deposits. So middens are basically just garbage piles. And you can tell what's old because it's on the bottom and the newer stuff is on the top. Um, and middens are very common in the American Southwest, um, much less common in Chihuahua, right? Much less common in Casas Grandes. So when they found these middens, they got super excited and they did a bunch of um, test pits, right? So I looked at a, about 107 shirts from both early and late midden deposits. About 41% was the beak for a polychrome, 25% was Ramos polychrome, and 34% was white paste the beak for a polychrome. Um, there's some differences in percentages, obviously, mostly this had to do with um, sampling on the fly and learning as I went, right? So site 204, this percentage basically reflects um, the nature of the assemblage, right? Um, so most of the assemblage that I looked at was the Bikra polychrome and white paste for Bikra polychrome. 
with some Ramos and then other types. Um, with the sales collection, because it was here in the United States, because I had it, um, I could spend a little more time. And so I kind of flattened that. Um, and I think it, it was a good strategy, right, to, to do things a little bit differently and see if it made a difference. Guess what? It didn't. Um, so sales collection, I did photography and neutron activation. Uh, neutron activation is a type. Oh, geez. Um, and site 204 are only photography. So what can I tell you, right? What I can tell you is that uh, Casas Grande's poly uh, polychromes, or at least Ramos, White Paste, Vigra, and Vigra, are made from primary rather than secondary clays. That means that there's a rock, it's eroding, there's this clay deposit, it is right there, right? This is different than, say, stuff being carried downstream. I also identified six petrographic groups, four of which are dominant, and these four dominant petrographic groups can be reduced to two geologically meaningful assignments. So I think some are tufts and some are rhyolitic flows. That's about what I can tell you. I can describe the nature of the thing, right? I can't tell you where they're made, and it's because they're all made with the same stuff. So 95% of sales material and 94% of the material from Site 204 are made using the same types of clay. This is bonkers. For potters hundreds of miles apart from each other to be making pottery the same way, I'm sorry, I can't pick out another place in the American Southwest or the greater Southwest that does that. Right? These people are making stuff the same way. They know how. They're seeking out materials very deliberately. And they don't, you know, they are consistently doing it through time. Right? So that's what Site 204 really demonstrates. There is no changes through time. I can't tell you where things are made. All I can tell you is that they're all the same. So this comes to plant behind this. People's inability to identify, notice, much less see plants in their own physical environment, which has been extended to the botanical researchers themselves, where doctoral students are unable to successfully execute plant species identification. Right? What I failed at as a researcher, and it's you know not my fault, right, is that I didn't understand the nature of the materials that I was working with before I picked my methods, right? Instead, I said, okay, petrography, neutron activation, you put those two together and you get an answer. And in this sense, because they're all the same, petrography finds difference mineralogically, neutron activation finds difference chemically. In both instances, there is no difference in either one, right? So now I have to find a new different method that finds differences between very closely related things. And I wish that I had known that way back. You know, I wish I had looked down the sherd and been like, oh, all of this is the same stuff. Like I am going to have to branch out. And instead, um, that's basically unfundable, right? Like I need to shoot lasers at the thing to find out if this technique works is a no-go, right? Um, Jane Kelly's quote here, I perceive perhaps erroneously that many of today's North American archeologists feel that the amount, kind, and quality of prior knowledge is not a major concern in designing and carrying out the next research project in a given area. Instead, one cites whatever research questions are de rigueur and attempts to address these questions. But then most of today's archaeologists have never wandered into a blank spot on the archaeological map. I'm in a blank spot, right? Explaining that to my colleagues is very difficult in terms of moving on, right? Um, so what is my responsibility as an expert specialist and colleague? Um, one of my things is I am broad, I am engaged, and I am interested, right? I am always reading about other things. I know my limitations, and I am forthright and honest about my research, right? Um, I don't obscure the fact, for example, in my dissertation that I did all of this work and here's the data. And if someone else can make something of it, 
you are welcome to. <laughs> that I would be incredibly grateful. Um, but I'm always present and persistent and consistent, right? Like I am not going to change what I have said based off of some kind of other theoretical drive, right? Um, and then I engage with colleagues in productive ways. And when I say productive, I mean data centric. Um, I'm very careful to both agree and disagree with people when it comes to their data and not their theoretical perspectives, right? Uh, we may not share theoretical perspectives, but it's not the issue that I take with folk. Um, so as I'm moving forward, right, I know that my discipline rewards these positive feedback loops where you have a project, you have these methods that work, there are these big fancy methods that use reactors and so forth, um, and then they um, produce data that answers a question, right? Um, how do I now convince people who hire me, people who give me money through grants and that type of thing, that this is now worth doing, right? Um, and that is, you know, that is my cargo, right, as I move forward um, with my research, right? So. Um, I would argue that archaeologists definitely suffer from a type of blind spot, a type of plant blindness, where we disregard the nature of the materials that we work with. And we think that we can kind of do this top down thing and that sometimes data push back. Um, and that just checking out the data and getting a new set is pretty irresponsible. So that's kind of what I had. Definitely one of my slides went missing. I had a very adorable picture of Chester as a baby grad student. So I'm a little disappointed that it got eaten by Google, but that's what I've got. At least Emma, you're not the, uh, you're not the only one here to be having technical difficulties. Um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, there was about 30 seconds where for some reason it took your slides down, muted your audio, and, and then just started showing me here, uh, fussing with the keyboard. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, I caught it pretty quickly. Um, All right. I'm going to stop sharing here. Yeah. Yeah, bring your face back on the screen so we can see you. All right. All right. So uh, welcome back. And... Uh, yeah, Pakime, uh, for those of you who watched my, um, who watched my Aurora talk, uh, and who watched, I believe it was last month's, yes, it was, uh, last month's chat with the archaeologist, you know, I've been, um, doing some research on the macaws, um, yeah. we have macaw iconography here, so, uh, <laughs> Pakime was one of the places with a, um, it had possibly the largest breeding colony of macaws outside of their native range. And so I'm glad yes. you brought them up. So whether or not they were actually being bred is a fairly contentious thing, right? So um, there has been some isotopic work done uh, and they were very obviously feeding um, most of the macaws a corn-based diet. And uh, modern breeders of course know that if you want them to breed, that's not the way. Right. Um, so whether or not they were successfully breeding is definitely a question. Um, that being said, um, there are, you know, there's the scarlet macaws and then there's the military macaws, right? Um, and they have done some really cool DNA studies um, uh, with military macaws. And uh, what they've found is that those that are local, right, that are actually living in that area, um, have exhibited a genetic bottleneck. And so what they think is that people introduced them to that area in the same way that like parakeets are in Pasadena <laughs> and um, in Bakersfield and places like that. And that they're like escaped, you know, they, they escaped and they naturalized, um, but that they do not exhibit the same uh, genetic diversity that others do to the South. So, the macaw research is very, very cool <laughs> and, <laughs> and always uh, exciting. And the topic of um, introduced species is yeah. going to be something that's going to come up in some of our stories. But first, Emma, I want to ask you, what do Hobby Lobby, Cornell University, and the Museum of the Bible have in common? Poor choices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
They're uh, all embroiled in a repatriation, um, you could say, scandal. And yeah, I think scandal is an appropriate word. So this is our uh, first news story of uh, four that we're going to bring you. So, yeah, um, the U.S., the United States as a whole, is about to repatriate 17,000 artifacts uh, that have been looted from Iraq. 12,000 of these are from Hobby Lobby and about 5,000 from Cornell. Um, do you have any comments you want to <laughs> throw on that one? Um, so first of all, shame on Hobby Lobby. Like this is not the first time they've been caught, right? Like it is illegal. It is internationally illegal. Stop doing it. Like, no, right? Um, that being said, it is something that also affects uh, the Casas Grandes area um, less so um, these days. So um, there is an existing potting community called Mato Ortiz that does modern replicas for collectors, right? Um, which is awfully cool. I have several. I commissioned a couple. I mean, these artists are amazing. Uh, that being said, a couple years ago, I found um, this collection, which is at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. General Pershing, when he was off chasing Pancho Villa around Chihuahua, when we totally did not invade Mexico. <laughs> like, never. Um, and basically, he sent all of these um, boys down Mexico to, to capture Pancho Villa and there was nothing to do. And so they excavated sites because they were bored. And uh, General Pershing had these boxes of archaeological artifacts that he started sending to the Smithsonian. And there's like actually telegrams like coming back from the, from, um, the Smithsonian that's like, stop. This is international law. Stop. <laughs> Like, please stop sending us stuff. This is illegal. Um, it is still in Washington, D.C., and it has not been repatriated. Also, the collection um, has been split or was split, and uh, the other half is at uh, the Field Museum at the University of Chicago. So another organization that has uh, been very reluctant to... Um, um, archaeological and other types of anthropological uh, materials that were um, ill-gotten, if you will, right? So. Yeah. And so one of the uh, issues you, you brought about uh, how a lot of these collections get donated, uh, and that's one way that uh, some of the collectors seem to be trying to uh, clear their consciousness, uh, consciences, rather, uh, if you will, but you know, really, it's it, it doesn't it doesn't really change that these are are ill gotten, and yeah, they're, they've been looted. Yeah, and so it, it's the responsibility of these institutions to do their due diligence. So yeah. when around the year two thousand, Cornell started to receive this collection of artifacts from a private collector, they really missed their responsibility at that moment to one hundred percent follow the provenance so yeah absolutely Shame you know and Cornell. anytime yeah and anytime it's questionable i mean you just give it back that's it so mm -hmm. one time i was at a blind auction in santa fe and someone offered to bid on something for me and i said well you know this is a casas grandes pot and she's like well that's what you said he'll buy it for you right and she just straight up bought it for me and like i never told her and she's now uh, passed on so she will never know but I turned around and I gave it to the Maxwell. Like I passed it off to Dave Phillips at the Maxwell. He was the director. He had a relationship with the embassy. And um, he was like, this is a Casas Grandes vessel. It is archeological in nature. It is not modern. Um, it, it was looted, right? Like pretty much guaranteed it was looted. Um, and they took it. And that is, you know, my responsibility as a professional archaeologist. And I don't particularly feel badly um, that someone else paid 40 bucks. It was a not-for-profit, you know, fundraiser type event, right? Mm -hmm. I'm glad someone, you know, donated it and that I was able to then get it home, right? It's not an important vessel. It wasn't cool looking. It's not museum quality. I expect to never see it again. Um, but it was still the right thing to do. And the important thing for our audience is that regardless of how pretty it is or how large it is or how complete it is, 
doesn't that matter. doesn't change how much archaeological data we can get out of it. Um, oh, absolutely not. I mean, I deal with shards that are this big. Yeah. <laughs> um, archaeological materials are archaeological materials. Yeah. All right. Um, moral of the story, if you shop Hobby Lobby, your money's going to looted artifacts. Moving on. Yeah, um, I know. Unfortunate. Uh, moving yeah. on, though, so this is this is your story, the uh, article, Archaeology of Climate Change. Do you want to introduce this one? Yeah, so this is an article in Forbes that I found that I, I really liked, even though they totally started with a, like, goony photo of, you know, Indiana Jones. <laughs> uh, but what they were talking about is a lot of the time, and this goes into your next article, we have this. Uh, distinct separation between quote unquote the natural world and man's world, right? We have this distinct separation that humans are, you know, special, um, that we have been set apart and that we live in the built environment and that the natural world is apart from us. And so oftentimes when we're talking about climate change and all of that other type of um, stuff, we talk about biodiversity and we talk about enhancing kind of quote unquote, the natural world. We talk about pandas, we talk about dolphins, we talk about sharks, we talk about um, monarch butterflies and creating habitats and corridors and that type of thing. Um, and what this article talks about, which I think is really great is instead of just focusing on uh, quote unquote, natural biodiversity, it also brings into account cultural biodiversity. And it really um, emphasizes that uh, global climate change doesn't, it's not um, the same in all places, right? So right now I'm sitting up in um, this upstairs bedroom and I'm like sweating because Maine right now is hot, like a lot of places. And usually it is not, right? No one here has AC. You know, it is a significant problem. Businesses shut down here because it's just too hot, right? Um, they just can't stay open. So culturally, what this article talks about is that um, diversity, cultural, in terms of uh, human cultures, means that we are adapting in different ways in different areas. So they're looking at um, farming techniques, you know, traditional farming. They're looking at um, uh, varieties of plants. And that's one of the things that I, as someone who is um, a very broad person or attempts to be broad, looking at ancient crops and um, uh, different types of um, heirlooms, right? And that type of thing and what they do and how you grow them. So um, coming to Maine right now, I'm going to be planting pawpaws in my backyard pawpaws are um, the North American mango. Um, they are not farmed. They're basically unfarmable. And it is because uh, you basically, as soon as you pick the fruit off, you have to eat it right then. It does not transport. That's it. Um, so right now there are 17 known varieties and there used to be probably in the 30s, right? So um, this uh, diversity has been um, reduced because people aren't eating it, right? It's just not part of our, you know, what we do, what we eat, how we farm, how we, what we keep in our yards, right? Um, and I think that that, it really helps break that down. Yeah. Um, sorry, folks. Uh, I, I think I've um, narrowed down the, the source of the issues to Windows itself. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna try to limp through the rest of this stream here. There we go. Got me back on the screen here, and uh, things are gonna be kind of flashing a little bit, and uh, and I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, one of the things that I, I, I like about this article is they, you know, bring up that um, like you said, there's that diversity in strategies, and so there's right. a value to bringing back traditional farming and indigenous right. fire management. As well as Absolutely. they talked about, um, they talked about irrigation, and yes. so I've got on the screen. Oh, uh, there we go. I've got on the screen now uh, a picture of my dog next to my grid garden when I had just planted it back in June, 
Uh, so you can Perfect. even see lo the little mounds where the, uh, the seeds are. Of course, now the, the corn, it's not the tallest corn. It's uh, a little uh, over a meter, maybe uh, 1.2 meters high right now. So it's a little short, but uh, the blue corn takes a little longer to grow. Um, and uh, it's irrigated by uh, a lateral off the acacia. So for those of you who watched the stream from May of last year, and I talked about indigenous agriculture and the origins of the acacia, um, that, that will be familiar. If you haven't checked that out, uh, you can go ahead and uh, look at that. The link is down in the description. Yeah, we're, man, I we're just having... Up. It, yeah, there must I be also, some kind of solar flare or something because yeah, it's hot. everything's going nuts. Um, yeah, um, I, I also love in terms of traditional irrigation using underground terracotta pots. Mm -hmm. And that's just brilliant for people that, you know, first of all, keeping water above ground, mosquitoes, that type of thing. That's a problem in my backyard right now. And also, Mainers are very accustomed to this thing called rain that falls from the sky. And uh, apparently, Maine is now undergoing dramatic shifts in water, like what oh, is geez. available in terms of rainfall. And it's oh, really, yeah, it Sorry, is really we're, bad. The, uh, the, the stream is just going nuts here. Um, okay. Gosh. Gosh, that's, um, we're just going to do side by side. Sorry, folks. Um, I, I, I actually can't control my computer right now. Um, uh, so we're going to try to uh, finish this one up. Um, but yeah, okay. archaeology of, of climate change that um, uh, also check out the SciShow link in the description. Uh, they do an episode, very similar topic uh, uh, about, you know, again, uh, traditional farming and how um, there's this uh, Victorian era romantic notion of untouched landscapes, but actually right. those landscapes were created by people. And this makes me okay. think of the dispersal of pinion nuts into the Great Basin happens the to Black follow forest. the return of people. Yep, the Black Forest, um, the uh, coconut trees on Pokai Bay on, on Oahu. Um, Another one. Yeah. And... Yeah. Uh, and so when we return to some of these these indigenous practices, we can see how, if we want to tie back in with the macaws, for example, um, there are these uh, uh, raised farming plots in Bolivia called Llanos, which provide macaw habitat that was not naturally in these areas. Um, so you're talking about the, the parakeets. And that reminds me of almost the reverse, you know, rather than raised, farming in, say, um, uh, in, farming in a wetland in central yeah. Mexico, there are these things. Pinampa. Exactly. And they provide critical habitat to the critically endangered axolotl. Yes. Right. You know, and like, so right now my backyard is just completely out of whack. I've got far too many predators, not anything else. I was watching these black swallowtails that were eating my parsley not using it right now they can eat my parsley and i've had all of these predators that just decimated you know and finally i was just like it was like five-year-old me kicked into gear and i like had to go save them i put them in a jar <laughs> and now they're all cocoons and everything and i'm like oh you know it's it's just very out of whack like yeah. yes predators have to eat too they exist usually i'm a little kumbaya but um in in this case like this is my responsibility. This is my yard, right? Mm -hmm. I can't have five bajillion mosquitoes. <laughs> this is not allowed. <laughs> no. And when the when the things that are eating our crops are out of whack, often that's a human impact as well, such as the deer in the Midwest. Yeah, all we've got is squirrels, chipmunks, mosquitoes, mm -hmm. and yeah. like my birds. My I have one pair of bluebirds in this entire neighborhood that I've kicked out. It. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, the birds it's are in trouble. Really desolate. Yeah, the birds are in super trouble. So, like, how am I? I have a quarter acre now. Mm -hmm. That's not inconsequential. So, how am I going to make this place, you know, hospitable? Right, right, and 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 the the theme that kind of connects both of these. I mean, one of the other themes that connects both of these uh, stories 
is this uh, story of managed ecosystems. So when we're thinking about our yards, of uh, thinking about it at, as an ecosystem that we are yeah. a part of. And uh, so uh, we're kind of running on over on time, so I just want to give you a chance to introduce this last story because we don't want to end on a negative note. This is a fun one. Oh, no. No. Um, so this last one is about Pompeii, which of course all archaeologists love, right? Um, and I'm going to uh, probably say this word wrong, but it's Thermopylum or Thermopolium, but I'm pretty sure it's Thermopylum. Um, and it, they've uncovered what is a fast food eatery in 2019, and it is now open to the public. Um, it was fresh out, of course, because um, Pompeii. And they found um, remnants of duck bones, pigs, goats, fish, snails, all in their earthenware pots and that type of thing. And they believe that this is indicative of paella, right? Which we all know and love. Um, and uh, what these snack bars, these fast food joints uh, were very well known for is uh, basically people who were very, very poor in cities. Um, didn't have kitchens, right? They had no real way of cooking for themselves. So this would have been one of the places that fed the masses, right? And um, I think that that's just uh, ridiculously charming, um, you know, that we can even like break it down to diet and that we can figure out a paella dish, right? You know, in archeological context, we never get that type of thing, so. There's a whole archeology span of food. Um, and, and a few YouTube channels that um, seem to reproduce old recipes, especially Roman. Yes. But like, you know, written documents are one thing. When we can find the actual, uh, the paella dish, when we, uh, even finding a, a loaf of bread or, or mm -hmm. a jar with residue from beer, um, we, yes. we learn so much more than we can learn from the written document alone. So a couple of years ago, I started making wine. Mm -hmm. And, and I've actually gotten good enough to this point uh, where I now inflict it upon others. Um, and they don't have to like it or drink it, but they have to tell me what they do or don't like about it kind of a thing. I need feedback, right? I'm at the feedback point. Um, but one of the things I really do like is basically uh, I make non-grape fruit wines. Uh, I'm I sorry, I, I have to cut you off. Um, okay. Th th this thing's uncontrollable. Uh, sorry. That's okay. Don't I, worry about it. All right. I, uh, I'm just kidding.